This is an engraving of Gresham College in the city of London. It was an important centre of scientific activity in the 17th century and the Royal Society held its meetings here from its foundation in 1660. But scientific activity, then as now, was wider than any single institution and it was undertaken by a variety of different groups. The Royal Society was certainly prominent but it's not easy to pin down its contemporary significance within the scientific community. The Society had no buildings of its own though evidence of its formal aspirations survives, including the first charter granted by Charles II in 1662. There is also its coat of arms, granted when the charter was revised in the following year. The volumes of Philosophical Transactions, published from 1665 onwards, describe the experiments performed at its meetings, together with other findings from Britain and abroad. The intention of the society was to reform knowledge in a fundamental way. But what was the early Royal Society like? And what was its role in the community at large? I think it's a real difficulty trying to get back to the starting point and understand what it was like to set up a scientific institution of the kind that the founders clearly wished at the time when they were doing so because of the Form the, 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 the status that the societies had in the 20th century. Um, I think that it, from the outset, there was an intention that it should be a formal um, national institution. And quite a lot was done to bring that about, like getting a royal charter, and the society was given a mace by the king, which gave it a status almost comparable to Parliament because Parliament functioned in the presence of a mace and here was a scientific debating society which was taking a similar style upon itself. At the outset there was a hope that they would c carry out all the experiments at the weekly meetings of the society that they needed to do to reform knowledge. I mean this was clearly ludicrously inadequate even by 17th century standards. But I think the idea that you could have a scientific clearing, a national scientific clearinghouse, was also to some extent an international one, um, did, did have real potential and did prove to be the society's main significance. Some of the projects of the period now seem rather fanciful. One member of the society proposed this idea for a cart with legs instead of wheels. The drawing is by the society's curator of experiments, Robert Hooke, who was responsible for setting up and evaluating experiments. It's symptomatic of the broad interests of the philosophical community as a whole that members' interests ranged from mere curiosities through technology to what we would now call science. This range is vividly shown by the early numbers of the society's philosophical transactions. This illustration from July 1665 shows on the left a design for a furnace and chimney used in a Belgian mine to encourage air circulation. On the same page is the head of a monstrous colt. Both were considered worthy of the society's attention. The range of people contributing information was also very great. Robert Hooke, perhaps best remembered for his microscope work, contributed many ideas including this paper on a method of keeping a record of the weather for a month at a time. It seems simple enough now, but exercises like this were part of a trend towards a rigorous and systematic approach which was important in the development of modern science. For other exercises, the Royal Society acted as a coordinator. This paper was part of an ongoing project on the tides, which drew together the findings of many amateur observers. It's an example of the Baconian way in which the Royal Society drew on activity and the community at large. Partly because the Royal Society exists in the late 17th century, it's very tempting to concentrate on it because it provides a useful focus for looking at science in the period as a whole. But it is very important indeed as for historians not to presume that anything that happened outside the Royal Society was unimportant or that everything that was important happened inside the Royal Society. Even when one looks at the Royal Society's members, almost by definition, much of their scientific work was carried out privately away from the Royal Society and did not just take place at society meetings. Indeed, quite early on, you find a 
trend towards merely reporting results to the Royal Society, say that the clearinghouse role of the Society is coming to the fore rather than the role of the Society as a forum where experiments were actually carried out. But what sort of scientific community was there outside the Royal Society? Gresham College, where the Society met, was an important centre for the application of mathematics to practical activities. The astronomy professor's lodgings were in this corner. Christopher Wren had been astronomy professor during the interregnum. On the opposite side, the physics professor's laboratory. In the corner, the lodgings of the geometry professor, Robert Hooke from 1665, and above, the observatory identified by the balustrade. This drawing by Hooke shows a 36-foot telescope set up in the courtyard of Gresham College in 1658. It was used by both Wren and Hooke. It was not only in London that scientific activity flourished. There were strong links between Gresham and Oxford. A number of professors at Gresham also held chairs at Oxford and divided their time between the two. There had been scientific activity at Oxford earlier in the 17th century, notably the work of William Harvey. After the Civil War, when royalists were purged from the university, a number of important figures in experimental philosophy were appointed to vacant posts. Wadham College became an important centre for wide-ranging scientific inquiry, led by the warden of the college, John Wilkins. Wilkins founded the Oxford Experimental Philosophy Club, which included Robert Boyle, Robert Hooke and Christopher Wren. The diarist John Evelyn visited Wilkins at Wadham and was impressed by his collection of scientific instruments. One item which Evelyn admired was a new type of beehive designed by Christopher Wren, constructed so that the honey could be removed without harming the bees and with glass panels so that the bees could be observed. The beehive was placed in the garden at Wadham, which united aesthetic, practical and scientific considerations according to the principles set down by Francis Bacon. Part of the garden was laid out in an elaborate geometrical pattern in the taste of the time. But the garden in Wilkins' day was also an important area for experiments on grafting, cultivation of fruit trees and horticulture in general. Wilkins and his colleagues therefore demonstrate the breadth of interests which the Wadham Circle explored. The idea that scientific inquiry should be of practical benefit was central to all this work. An illustration of such practical applications is the Sheldonian Theatre in Oxford, one of the first buildings designed by Christopher Wren. This was for university meetings, which had previously taken place in St Mary's Church. Wren's background was in maths and natural philosophy, and his practical work as an architect developed out of this training. The building is circular, with no visible support for the ceiling, and Wren made use of mathematical principles for its construction. The ceiling was supported from above by an elaborate network of timbers in a pattern which had been calculated by the mathematician John Wallace. This practical application of science was important both at Oxford and at the Royal Society. The Society always takes for granted that what it's doing is, is useful. There's no doubt in their mind that what they're doing is, is absolutely crucial um, because it will be of benefit to human life and it won't just be a, a, a sort of refined intellectual exercise and there's a constant stress in the polemic on behalf of the society of the difference of the new philosophy from the old Aristotelianism because of that element of, of utility. A major example of the practical application of science outside the Royal Society was the foundation of the Royal Observatory at Greenwich under the patronage of King Charles II. Here, John Flamsteed became the first astronomer royal and spent several decades of his life making observations. But the founding of the observatory was not just the result of scientific curiosity. This grew out of a grouping that had surrounded the Surveyor of Ordnance to the King, Sir Jonas Moore, who was based at the Tower of London. And it seems that under Moore, the Tower of London became quite a scientific centre, particularly of applied science, of science that could be put to use for, for the purposes of the government, for uh, military and other purposes. <laughs> 
And I think the foundation of the observatory is to be seen in that context. The specific purpose of the observatory was laid down in a royal warrant. The Astronomer Royal was to apply himself with the most exact care and diligence to the rectifying the tables of the motions of the heavens and the places of the fixed stars so as to find the much desired longitude of places for the perfecting the art of navigation. The fixing of a ship's longitude, its east-west position, was the main problem for King Charles's navy and it was to take many years to solve it. Flamsteed's approach involved the accurate mapping of star positions and their apparent motion. Flamsteed used this octagon room for observations, though much of his observing was also done from a small building which no longer exists. On the wall are year clocks by Thomas Tompion, though now replaced by replicas. Flamsteed used them to check that the length of the day remained constant, a vital basis for his astronomical observations. The clocks, together with a number of other instruments, were given by Sir Jonas Moore. None of Flamsteed's own instruments survive. They were removed from the observatory by his widow after his death. But there are engravings of some of them. They included this seven-foot equatorial sextant, which required three people to operate it. Flamsteed's observations resulted in an important work in three volumes in which the accurate mapping of the celestial bodies was significantly advanced. But Flamsteed was unusual in 17th century England because he was one of the very few people who had a career in science. The number of people in the 17th century who have a career structure that is anything like what we would recognise as that of a scientist in the 20th century is very small indeed. There are a handful of professors of s subjects to do with natural philosophy at Oxford and Cambridge in this period. Beyond that, there are really only two people who one could define as being scientists in a, in a modern sense, both of whom were professionally engaged in, in, in scientific investigation, namely Robert Hooke as curator of the Royal Society and John Flamsteed as Astronomer Royal. So beyond that, virtually everyone who is involved in scientific activity in natural philosophy is to our eyes an amateur, that they're doing it either in time that is given to them because they have private means or in spare time from other careers. These amateurs were known as virtuosi and they ranged from Robert Boyle, famous for his work in chemistry, whom we would certainly call a scientist, to people like the diarist John Evelyn, whose interests ranged from scientific experiments to collecting rarities. In the Jeffrey Museum in London, there's a reconstruction of a typical closet of curiosities of the late 17th century, including a large cabinet which Evelyn acquired in 1652 to house part of his collection. It was made in Paris, and the exterior is of ebony, decorated with delicate patterns of tulips and other flowers. The doors open to reveal an intricate arrangement of inner doors, sliding panels and drawers decorated with parquetry. The inventory of Evelyn's house lists this as a very large ebony cabinet in the dining room. But tantalisingly, the list of its contents was never filled in. We can be sure that Evelyn would have kept the smaller items of his collection of curiosities in it, but we don't know exactly what they were. However, on and around the cabinet in this exhibition are typical items which virtuosi of the period, including Evelyn, did collect. An armadillo, a baby alligator, in an alcove, a selection of natural and artificial curiosities, the skull of a turtle, rocks and other minerals. On a table, various shells, some of them commonplace now, but including examples from tropical seas which were rare in England in Evelyn's day. A collection like this may now seem haphazard, but it was out of such beginnings that important museum collections and scientific classification were to grow. The Ashmolean Museum in Oxford had its origin in such a collection gathered by the Tredescant family in the early 17th century and then extended by Elias Ashmole. This formed the focus for Oxford science in the 1680s.
the Royal Society's own museum in London had similar origins. The link between the virtuosi and the Royal Society is exemplified by the fact that the Royal Society's museum took its origin in one of these virtuoso cabinets. This was a cabinet that had been collected by a man called Hubert, which had been on public display in London. And the Royal Society bought it lock, stock and barrel, including all of the items that it contained, many of which were curiosities of the kind which the virtuosi valued. The Royal Society published a catalogue of their collection in 1681, showing that they intended it to be a tool of scientific research, not just a collection of curiosities. The illustrations show the range. A piece of stone patterned like a landscape. Shells including the lesser Persian whelk. The skeleton of a crocodile. Evelyn writes that there was a traditional belief that the upper jaw was mobile, but satisfied himself from this specimen that it was fixed. Evelyn did not catalogue his own collection, but he did write a major work, Silver, a book principally on the different varieties of trees, which became his most famous work. It was published by the Royal Society, and it was prompted by the shortage of timber for building ships for the Navy. Published with silver is a gardener's almanac, again a work which combines scientific observation with sound practical use. Gardening was an interest which brought together virtuosi, natural historians and medical men. A physic garden had existed at Oxford since the early 17th century, founded to help the training of physicians. The Chelsea Physic Garden was founded in 1673 by the Society of Apothecaries. But both gardens had medical and non-medical uses. When one goes down to the other parts of the medical community, such as apothecaries and so on, they also have concerns which overlap with the concerns of the new science, particularly in the field of botany, because apothecaries obviously have an interest in plants because of the medicinal purposes to which they can be put. And this is an interest which overlaps with the interest in the classification and categorization of plants that you find in botanists of the period, such as John Ray. And the apothecaries provide a useful facility which non-apothecaries are also able to use in the form of the physic garden that the apothecaries founded at Chelsea during the Restoration period in the 1670s. The purpose of Chelsea Physic Garden was to train apothecaries, physicians, the doctors of the time, how to learn to recognize and use plants in their medicine. And so there was a very strong tie-up between the practice of medicine and the, the learning of botany. You had to learn uh, how to recognize the plants that were useful, the ones known to be useful, from the ones that might be harmful, uh, uh, poisonous, or, or indeed just, just neutral. We know from the earliest map of the garden that then, as now, the garden was predominantly made up with these narrow rectilinear beds, the chief purpose of which was to enable the botany student, medical student, to get close enough to see the plant in the round, uh, to learn its, its detail, and to give the opportunity for thematic displays to be planted. In the centre of the garden is a statue of Hans Sloan, who was associated with the garden for many years. Sloan is one of the most important medical students to have passed through the garden. Indeed, he'd completed some of his training here as a doctor shortly after the garden was founded. We can deduce something of the pattern of training of doctors at that time from Sloan's herbarium, his collection of dried plants which is preserved in the Natural History Museum in London. This shows that Sloan and other medical students were taken out into the local fields to examine and collect specimens of useful plants. Many of these are still grown in the Chelsea Physic Garden. Well, here we have a plant of Tutsum, which is typical of the sort of plant that doctors coming to train here at Chelsea Physic Garden at the end of the 17th century would undoubtedly have learnt. Uh, indeed, its English name, Tutsan, is derived from the French, two songs, heal all, um, and at that time it was considered to be uh, um, a, a useful plant in treating wounds. In order, as much as anything, to ensure continuity of supply uh, for teaching, uh, 
uh, plants like this would have been maintained as stocks within the garden. Many plants in the garden today were in regular medical use in the 17th century. Pasque flowers used very little nowadays because as a fresh plant it is extremely poisonous but in a dried state it used to be used as a sedative. Lungwort is uh, one example of a doctrine of signatures plants. The spotting on the leaf was thought to resemble a diseased lung and therefore it was held that the plant might be of some use in treating lung disease, a fanciful notion which was uh, discredited during the 17th century. Heartsease is a doctrine of signatures plant. The shape of the, both the flowers and the leaves, depending on uh, how you look at them, both considered to resemble the heart and therefore to be useful in treating diseases of the heart. Mandrake is a highly poisonous plant used since classical times. The poisons it contains have sedative properties. The plants which Sloan collected were carefully organized with cross-references to the two principal herbals of the day by Gerard and Ray. G.E.R. is an abbreviation for Gerard. This sort of activity was therefore both medical, to benefit humanity directly, and scientific in that it was an early step towards the classification of plants. Some of Sloane's later collections were used by Linnaeus in the 18th century in establishing his system. As a collector, Sloane could also be classed as a virtuoso, like Evelyn, and his collections were to form the basis of the British Museum. From his origins as a medical student and botanist working in the Chelsea Physic Garden, he was later to become a prominent member of the Royal Society. So many of the prominent figures involved in different areas of scientific activity were connected with the Royal Society. Is it therefore right to see the Royal Society as the centre of all this activity? I think there's a slight paradox about the late 17th century because in institutional terms the Royal Society had problems which didn't get any better as the decades passed. There were crises in the 1690s as there had been in the 1670s and yet the Society has during this time is presiding over a great e expansion of the activities to which it's devoted with which people at the time instinctively associate the society. So one does see a major growth in scientific activity in the period which the Royal Society is the symbol of and it's right in that sense to speak about this if you like as the age of the Royal Society. But I think one's r reminded of the fact that activity in natural philosophy and cognate pursuits is always wider than anything narrowly defined by a single institution, by the fact that this um, wide range of activity go, 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 goes on at a time when the society itself is, do, is doing badly. Science by the 1690s is clearly much better established in England, much more scientific activity is going on than had been the case in the middle of the century. And it's in this context that the great discoveries of the time take place.